What if a few of drones could shatter a billion dollar empire before dawn? At 6.15 a.m., over the cold expanse of the Gulf of Finland, a formation of Ukrainian UJ-26 Beaver drones slipped through the fog, silent, fast, and almost invisible. Their destination, Luga, Russia's largest Baltic port, home to a billion-dollar energy hub, and the pride of Moscow's coastal defenses. Within the next hour, every layer of that defense, radar, missiles, electronic warfare, would ignite, collapse, and burn. This wasn't just a strike. It was a live experiment in modern warfare, precision versus power, algorithms against armor. Stay with me, because by the end of this story, you'll understand how a few thousand dollars worth of drones rewrote the logic of a trillion ruble defense. Would you have seen it coming before the fog turned red? At 6.15 local time, 17 Ukrainian UJ-26 Beaver drones skimmed across the dark waves of the Gulf of Finland, racing toward Luga, Russia's largest Baltic port, once labeled impenetrable. They had flown 940 kilometers overnight, hugging the sea at barely 12 meters above the water, their engines burning hot and nearly out of fuel. The air was still, the fog low, and the world asleep until the first Russian patrol appeared. From the haze, a Vasily-class gunboat cut across their path. The next seconds were chaos. Tracer rounds streaked through the dawn light like burning comets. A 14.5 mm cannon opened up, its rounds slicing through the air so close that pressure waves rippled across the drone's carbon fiber shells. One drone exploded in a silent burst of flame, scattering fragments across the sea. The rest dove, just eight feet above the surface, evading the gunfire with precision that no human pilot could match. From a command bunker near Kiev, operators watched the grainy satellite feed flicker with static. They could hear the gunfire through the data stream, faint, delayed, but unmistakable. Three IGLA-S missiles fired from the patrol boat, each worth tens of thousands of dollars, chasing shadows across the Baltic. Two missed completely. The third detonated too early, fooled by salt spray. Sixteen drones pressed on, silent, relentless, low against the waves. Forty kilometers ahead, their next enemy waited, a trillion-ruble air defense system that had never failed, until tonight. If you were one of those drone operators, watching your fuel dip and the radar light up red, would you press on or turn back? Tell me in the comments. At 628, alarms echoed through the coastal command post outside Luga. The S-400 Triumph air defense battery, Russia's pride and symbol of invulnerability, switched from search mode to kill mode. Its 92N-6A radar, built to track stealth aircraft 400 kilometers away, now faced a swarm of targets smaller than seagulls. The radar operator blinked. On his screen, the drones appeared as flickering dots, their radar reflections barely 10% of a normal aircraft. He initiated track via missile, a desperate tactic to let the missile itself find the target mid-flight. Seconds later, three 48N6DM missiles, each worth $2.3 million, tore into the fog. The roar shook the wetlands for miles. Physics, however, was not on Russia's side. The beavers dropped altitude again, to just six meters above the waves. The missiles tried to dive after them, but their fins stalled, airflow collapsing under low altitude and high humidity. Two plunged straight into the sea, the third exploded, prematurely, showering the surface with molten fragments. Inside the Russian bunker, panic mixed with disbelief. 17 targets had entered the defense zone. 15 were still flying. That meant nearly $7 million in missiles had been spent to destroy one drone worth less than a family car. The S-400 crew called for reinforcement. Four Panzer S-1 units were ordered to form a secondary ring of fire. Operators loaded new 57E-6 missiles and prepared their twin 30mm cannons. The airspace above the Baltic turned into a furnace of radar beams, smoke trails, and confusion. And yet, as the Russian defenses tightened their net, the drones adjusted again, scattering, climbing, splitting formation. What came next wasn't just survival, it was evolution. 
If you were the commander of that S-400 battery, watching millions vanish into the sea, what would you do? Fire again, or hold your ground? By 641, the sky over the Baltic had turned into a lattice of contrails and flame. The four Pantsir S-1 systems, Russia's close-range goalkeepers, came alive, each locking onto a separate cluster of drones. Their 57 E-6 missiles, valued at $120,000 apiece, streaked upward in rapid succession, chasing heat signatures the size of birds. The first salvo detonated in mid-air, scattering shrapnel across the mist. One beaver vanished into a cloud of sparks, another continued, wings torn but still flying. The surviving drones responded instantly, executing what analysts later called the spinning star maneuver. A synchronized spiral where each drone circled a central point while moving forward, constantly changing its angle of approach. For the Pantsir operators, it was chaos. Their radars showed not 15 clean tracks, but nearly a hundred fragmented echoes as debris and reflection merged into noise. Unable to maintain lock, they switched to twin 30mm cannons, filling a cubic kilometer of sky with 5,000 rounds per minute. Tracers turned the horizon orange. Metal rained into the sea like falling meteors. Four drones were shredded. Fragments plummeted like burning leaves. But eleven pressed forward. Wounded. Erratic. Unstoppable. Russia's coastline now echoed with overlapping alarms from Narva to Kronstadt, as other bases reported similar swarms. By the time the smoke cleared, the defenders had spent over $20 million in missiles and ammunition, yet most of the attackers were still airborne. The battlefield had changed. This was no longer a test of weaponry, but of endurance and adaptation. And the next challenge would not come from the air, it would come from the invisible realm of signals. At 6.57, Russia unleashed its invisible weapon, the Kaska 5 Electronic Warfare Complex, a $24 million truck-mounted system that could drown entire frequency bands in electromagnetic noise. From a hill overlooking the coast, its massive dish rotated like a radar moon, blasting power across 1.2 to 6 gigahertz. Within seconds, the air over Luga became saturated with static. To human ears, it would have sounded like silence. But to the Ukrainian drones, it was chaos. Commands vanished mid-transmission, telemetry froze, and navigation systems began to flicker. The Kaska's sweep and dwell algorithm scanned the sky, locked onto the 2.47 GHz's control channel, and poured out 20 kilowatts of raw interference, enough to melt unshielded circuitry within seconds. Yet, the beavers did not fall. They switched modes, jumping between 128 encrypted frequencies per second, an algorithm preloaded in their onboard AI cores. The Russian jammers, unable to predict the next hop, escalated to barrage jamming, flooding every frequency simultaneously, a move that consumed three megawatts of power and temporarily knocked out local civilian communications across three towns. Still, the drones endured. Their signals cut, they shifted into autonomous terrain tracking mode, flying by radar altimeter and 3D maps recorded months before. But the world had changed since then. New cranes, towers, and unfinished platforms loomed unseen in the fog. Three drones collided within 60 seconds, their carbon shells shattering against steel. The rest, just eight survivors now, flew on through the electromagnetic storm, blind but guided by stored memory. Ahead lay Luga itself, and one more layer of defense waiting to erase them from the sky. By 722, the Baltic turned gray with rising fog. The last eight beavers dropped to three meters above the surface, flying through salt mist so dense their optical cameras became blind within seconds. Radar altimeters pinged constantly, keeping them from slamming into the water. The air smelled of static, fuel, and seawater. On shore, Russian defenses switched from missiles to mathematics. With long-range radars overwhelmed, operators calculated intercept paths manually grids of coordinates where they predicted the drones would pass. Four Pantsir S, one units fired in sequence, their shells tracing invisible walls through the fog. The sound rolled over the bay like thunder. Two drones vanished, 
torn apart by blind fire they never saw coming. The survivors flew on. Their batteries dropped below 15%, power readings blinking red across their systems. GPS feeds began to distort as Russian R340 tons, spoofing arrays came online, broadcasting false coordinates. To the drones, the map shifted, rivers appeared, where there should be roads, and the horizon bent. Two beavers obeyed the lie, banking right and diving straight into the sea. Now only four drones remained. They had no live feed, no pilot input, and almost no power. Their onboard computers switched to inertial guidance, using motion sensors and gyroscopes to continue the pre-programmed strike path. As the fog thickened, even the Russian crews lost track of them. Silence returned to the port for the first time that morning. But beneath that calm, four invisible machines crept toward Luga's most vital target. The cryogenic gas complex that powered half the region's exports. At 7.49, the final four beavers emerged from the fog like phantoms. Their propellers cut through the wet air, engines whining as voltage dipped below 11.2 volts. Ahead of them loomed the sprawling Luga cryogenic gas facility, 420 acres of pipes, storage tanks, and cooling towers, holding nearly 1.8 million cubic meters of pressurized hydrocarbons. The complex was worth over $2.4 billion, protected by armored patrols, water cannons, and infrared sensors now half-blinded by mist. A lookout on the western platform caught a flicker of motion too late. The first drone skimmed over the pipeline yard at 145 kilometers per hour, clipped by machine gun fire that shattered one propeller, yet momentum carried it forward. It struck a venting manifold head-on. The explosion was small, a white flash, but it tore open a pressure seal that had held since the Soviet era. Methane hissed skyward. The second beaver dived through the vapor cloud seconds later. Its thermal camera locked onto a bright column, the cryogenic fractionator. The coldest point in the complex, sitting at 163 degrees Celsius. The operator in Kyiv took manual control through an Iridium satellite link. Despite a 2.3 second delay, he guided the drone between steel towers and pipelines, every command lagging behind reality. When the feed froze, he flew blind, trusting the last coordinates. Impact. The drone hit the fractionator's base at 40 kilometers per hour. Its 18 kg thermite-enhanced warhead ignited instantly, burning at over 2,600 degrees Celsius. The blast punched through the steel shell, vaporizing supercooled liquid inside. Within five seconds, the gas expanded 600 times in volume, overpressurizing the network. Tanks ruptured in sequence 1, then 6, then 34. The result was a fuel-air detonation that rippled across the complex like a rising sun. A fireball 230 meters high engulfed the facility, melting cranes, storage tanks, and armored vehicles parked nearby. Shockwaves shattered windows 20 kilometers away. For six days, the blaze burned visible from orbit, seen from Estonia's border, and remembered by every radar screen in the Baltic. Ukraine's smallest machines had just inflicted one of the largest industrial losses of the war. By the time the flames over Luga finally dimmed, six days later, nothing recognizable remained, just twisted steel, scorched concrete, and a column of smoke visible from space. A $2.4 billion facility had fallen to machines that cost less than a single missile guidance chip. It wasn't just an explosion. It was a message that in modern war, Precision, data, and patience can defeat even the strongest walls of steel. The balance between offense and defense has shifted forever, and what once made nations powerful may now make them vulnerable. The world watched in silence. But the signal was clear. The battlefield no longer belongs to the biggest army. It belongs to whoever can disappear first. If you were in command that night, would you have seen it coming? Let me know what you think in the comments below.